All right. Can everybody online see the presentation? Can you just give me a thumbs up. Thanks, Robin. All right. Um, we're figuring out the technology in the room, but I think we've got everything under control. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm Megan Litke. I'm Director of Sustainability um, at the university. I have been here for 10 years officially this past weekend. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about community and sustainability with you all today. So um, we're a pretty small group, so please feel free to ask questions as we go through. It would be great to you know, make it more interactive. It's a long session too, so feel free to stand up if you need to, move around, um, and uh, we'll get going. This is just the session description, um, but today I'm gonna talk a lot about our students and their perceptions of sustainability and really everybody's perceptions of it and how it feeds into our day-to-day -day life. We're going to talk about what sustainability is and how broad that really is and then we're going to connect those dots and oh you guys can't see though let me get rid of this that's better um and we'll work on connecting those dots and how we can use all of that information to help us all build community around sustainability so first some statistics around sustainability we know from an inside higher ed poll that 71% of college students actually take a class related to sustainability, regardless of their major. So students are really interested in this. They're hearing about it a lot. They want to learn about it more. They want to see it in their day to day lives. At AU, in a poll that we did here on campus, we learned that 91% of our students agree or strongly agree that we as a society are exceeding our environmental limits, but only half of our students think that their individual actions on our campus matter. So there's a disconnect that we're seeing right on our campus, and that is reflected more broadly across the United States when we see that 72% of Americans believe that global warming is happening, but only 36% of us are even talking about it occasionally. Like, I'm sure we can all think about how like, I talk about it all the time, but <laughs> most people probably aren't talking about it every single day. Um, a few more statistics um, from Yale. So Yale has a whole program. They do this massive survey every year across the United States to get people's perceptions about climate change, the risks involved, what actions should be taken. And if you go to their website, you can actually drill down to your zip code and learn what's happening in your county um like how people's perceptions are where you live and then you can look at it more broadly so these statistics are from the entire united states but they obviously vary depending on um, the locale so 46 percent of and this is all u.s adults um think that global warming will harm us personally so about half of the country thinks it's going to harm us but even more about 67 percent believe it will harm people in developing countries. So we see a, a disconnect there of it might be happening over there, but I don't need to worry about it as much. Um, but 75% of Americans think that it should be taught in schools. So that really aligns pretty well with the number of students that we see taking uh, sustainability classes. And then 69% think that corporations should do more. Um, Corporations was as close as we had to universities in this poll. It was really just government and business. So I pulled out corporations because they're looking for larger entities to do something about it, like bigger than just an individual approach. When we zoom in and look at Gen Z, this was a Lancet poll. And um, this was a poll done in 2021 of 16 to 25 year olds. Three out of four said the future is frightening, which is a pretty big word, <laughs> like that, that hits. Um, and 45% say that their feelings about it are impacting their daily life. So this isn't something that they're thinking about 36% of the time. This is something they're thinking about 100% of the day, like that they're going through life thinking about this in the back of their head. The authors of that study said that this distress um, is associated with young people perceiving that they have no future. They also feel abandoned and um, uh betrayed by both their government and just by adults in general. So we can all do something to, to change the way that they're viewing that by changing um, how we're talking about it with them. This was uh, headlines that I pulled yesterday. Um, so we have like parts of the boreal forest in Canada are burning faster than they can regrow. Uh, deadly landslides in India make climate change are made worse by climate change. How close are the planet's tipping points? Um, 
they would be impossible uh, to reverse how climate change is affecting pregnant women, the demise of the Great Barrier Reef. Like this is all depressing and hard to read, right? And I can also, I mean, to be fully transparent, you can also look for uplifting headlines around climate change, but is that what's really sticking with people or are these the headlines that are sticking with our students, right? Um, and these are what I just Googled yesterday for climate change headlines and what I found. Um, so, the good news is, though, that we as a society have the tools we need to mitigate climate change. We can do something about this. What's missing is collective action to move that needle forward. But building community can help eliminate that feeling of isolation, that feeling of loneliness that's coming from thinking that you're the only one who's caring about it. On campus, this is completely anecdotal from the students that we talk to in our office, they tell us that they come to AU, at least in part, because of sustainability. They hear that we care about it, they see it on their tours, but then when they get here, they don't see it embedded the way that they expected. They think that it's going to be seen in every office, and really they're just seeing it in a few key locations around campus or in a few areas. So how can we, as American University, change that and make it easier for them to see it? Oh, I make that I made it go away earlier. Maybe it'll go away now. Anyway, I'll just tell you the definition since you can't see it right now. But the definition of sustainability is meeting the needs of the present without jeopardizing the ability of future generations to meet their needs. This definition was, um, I mean, this is paraphrased, but coined by the UN in the 1980s during a, a commission on, on climate change. Um, it's so much more than recycling and turning off the lights, right? That's kind of the bare minimum of, of what we can do to impact climate. Really everything we do throughout the day is gonna be connected to sustainability. And I think what's really important to zoom in on is the first part of this sentence, meeting the needs of the present. So when we talk about meeting the needs of the present, that's meeting the needs of everyone in the present. Does everyone have access to the food and shelter that they need? Do they feel safe in their communities? So all of those things matter. This depiction of, um, sustainability behind me has the concentric circles. You might also have seen it as a Venn diagram where they just kind of overlap, but you could have economy separate from the environment. I like this one because I think without the environment, how do we have society and how do we have an economy within our society? And so I think this one makes more sense, but a lot of people use that Venn diagram, one where sustainability is in the middle at the intersection of thinking about all three of these things. There we go. Um, if you guys were in yesterday morning's topic, this uh, eight dimensions of wellness came up and I had never seen it before, but as I looked at it, I was like, whoa, this is really connected to sustainability and we talk about sustainability and wellness all the time. Um, I mean, we could go through this circle and talk about all of the different ways that sustainability connects to all of this, but I think it's just important to note that um, addressing our own personal wellness is going to be connected to this bigger societal wellness and sustainability right so there's a lot of overlap between the two if we're thinking about our personal wellness you know we can think about um our like emotional well-being but if we're thinking about sustainability and we're looking at the emotional piece then we can think about how are we making sure that nature is supporting that and that it's not harming it right so this can kind of grow out into direct connections to sustainability really all the way around the circle. I'm going to give a quick primer in a few big sustainability topics that I think we hear all the time, but maybe we don't know the ins and outs of. This is the greenhouse effect. Um, does anyone like know how that works? <laughs> so the sun shines down on the earth, right? And we rely on that greenhouse, uh, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to trap some of that heat energy from the sun makes the earth very pleasant to live on generally. If we put too many gases in that greenhouse gas layer, then not enough can escape back out. So you can see the arrows where it's bouncing back off and escaping back out. And we need some of it to be able to escape back out. But with too many greenhouse gases, more and more gets trapped. And that's what starts to cause the impacts of temperature rise, sea level rise, more storms, uh, more unpredictable storms, wildfires, because of changes in um, precipitation around the country, around the world, I mean, um, and then biodiversity changes because where an animal might be thriving is suddenly got a different climate. They can't migrate fast enough. They can't adapt fast enough. And so it impacts ultimately biodiversity. Uh, carbon dioxide is the most prevalent 
greenhouse gas. It lives in the atmosphere for a really long time, which is another big part of it. Methane is far more potent. Its lifetime in the atmosphere is a lot shorter. Um, nitrous oxide comes primarily from our cars, transportation, and then um, CFCs and uh, halogens um, come from refrigeration. It's kind of like this hidden source of greenhouse gases. They're a big deal, like they are responsible for a lot of warming, but um, we don't talk about them as much. We don't have as much daily impact on them as we do these other things, right? Feel free to ask questions as we go. <laughs> this is the Keeling curve. Has anyone seen the Keeling curve before? No, have you? Yeah, I hope you have. <laughs> um, so the Keeling Curve is a research center that's located on Mauna Loa in Hawaii, and it tracks daily carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. It's located in Hawaii because it's not near anything, right? So it's not impacted by uh, changes in the atmosphere that might be happening locally. Um, anyone want to take a guess why it goes up and down each year? No, it's actually because um, if you look at the earth, most of the land mass is on the global north. And so in the summer, when those leaves are all on the northern trees, there's more absorption of carbon dioxide happening. So it goes down in, the, in our winter. When those leaves fall off of the trees, carbon dioxide goes up globally because that's where most of the trees are in the world. Um, so obviously it's continuing to rise. Scientists, this is how far back we've had this observatory on um, Mauna Loa, but obviously industrialization happened before this, and scientists have other methods of looking at carbon dioxide going further back in time. Um, ice cores are a big source of long term, um, or, or like looking at the carbon dioxide concentrations from a long time ago. They're able to pull bubbles out of ice cores um, and see what the concentrations were in there. So this is going back 800,000 years. Um, so you can see a lot of rise and fall that's happened naturally. This most recent dip here um, was the last ice age. As you can see right now, what we're experiencing is pretty unprecedented in like the last 800,000 years. So um, we don't know everything that's gonna happen. There's a lot of uncertainty in the science. And sometimes in the news, we hear like, oh, you know, scientists weren't quite sure. and yeah, that's happening a lot because this is very unprecedented. So everybody's figuring it out um, and learning more and more each year. So the science is getting better and better each year. So then when we think about the impacts of all of that, um, we don't all experience those impacts equally. The, like everybody on earth is not gonna have the same, like, oh, it's a little bit warmer experience. Uh, we know that communities of color, low income communities experience uh, disproportionate impacts from the direct pollution but also disproportionate impacts from the increased temperature rise, um, frequently uh, in inner city communities where there's not as much trees, they actually experience even more temperature rise because of um, local effects that cause the temperature to go up even more in urban areas. So when you move out into other areas where there are trees, that's gonna help capture some of that heat, you have more shade, all those things have an impact. So uh, there's a huge difference there. In the United States, 68% uh, of Black Americans live within 30 miles of coal-fired plants, so more likely to experience the impacts of that. Um, it puts communities in these areas at risk for a whole host of different health concerns. So we can bring it back into that wellness issue that it's not just about reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Using these things also has an impact on people's health. Um, a lot of times uh, you may hear the term environmental justice, environmental racism, and that's what these terms refer to. Um, Globally, uh, communities of color, low income, persons with disabilities, women and children are all disproportionately impacted. Um, when we think about those wildfires last year, children actually breathe faster than we do. So it's not just that their lungs are developing while they're being exposed to that smoke, they're breathing in like twice as much of it in the same amount of time as we are. Um, so for waste, uh, first, I'm going to give a quick primer on how waste works at the university. So we have compost, recycling, and trash. Our compost used to be in orange bins. You'll now see it migrating over to green bins um, as we release all of our new bins on campus. In the compost bins should go food and any like food serviceware that's marked compostable. Recycling is for glass, plastic, paper, and metal. 
no food or liquid should go in there though. So if you have like a half full soda bottle, dump it out before you recycle it, that liquid can contaminate the whole bag. Um, and then trash is everything else. Uh, candy wrappers are a big contaminant we see somewhere else. Um, when we look at the environmental justice impacts of zero waste, we see that 79% uh, of incinerators are located in environmental justice communities. We know that um, from a study a while ago that the predominant indicator of if you lived near a landfill was race, not socioeconomic income or anything like that. It was just Black Americans were more likely to live near landfills. Um, we, I mentioned that methane is more potent than carbon dioxide, and methane comes um, from landfills. So anytime you throw away an organic material, as it breaks down, landfills are compacted. So as it breaks down without access to oxygen, it's going to release methane. If you put it in the compost bin, it's going to break down with access to oxygen and it will turn into beautiful soil amendment and like have a really positive impact. So it's pretty, uh, there's a, a huge disparity between what you could do with it and what often happens with it. Um, and then the use of single use plastics. Um, they obviously have an environmental concern. Only about 8% of plastic in the United States is actually recycled. When it does get recycled, it can't be recycled indefinitely. So eventually that plastic is gonna end up in landfill. So really recycling plastic is just delaying its arrival in the landfill. It's not keeping it out of landfill forever. Um, it, like metal cans, um, like a um, soda can, can be melted down and turned back into a soda can infinite times. But plastic can't do that. It breaks down and degrades, and then ultimately it can't be turned back into something else. Um, but there are also health implications that come from working in the production of those types of materials. When we drink out of them, we're absorbing plastic into our bodies. Um, we all ingest or absorb into our bodies about a credit card's worth of plastic each week, which is wild. Um, and then in the disposal, obviously, there's a lot of concerns. So I like to think of uh, waste not just as a way to reduce the amount of land that's going to landfill, but there are a lot of direct human impacts from making better choices about what we're buying, how we're disposing of it. Um, it can be an, an act of, of uh, reducing um, environmental injustices by choosing to, to use the right bins when you're recycling or choosing to not buy something that might have a negative impact. So when we look at solutions, there's kind of two sides of that, right? Those individual actions that we can take and then things that really need to happen on a much broader scale, policy changes, corporates, corporations need to do something different. That goes back to seeing that um, young people or no, that as a country we wanna see, I think 69% of people wanted to see corporations do more and then cultural shifts, right? Um, and so on that scale, it feels like our individual actions don't matter so much. And it's true that, you know, we really need the larger organizations to make change, but we can influence that and our day to day actions do still matter. So it's not really a which one it's a both and like, how can we make these changes and, and move the needle forward in a lot of different ways, like by voting with our dollars, but also voting when we vote. So uh, I want to take a minute to just check in because that is a lot of stuff. How are you all feeling? <laughs> I think it's crazy that we just just the two credit size cards. One possible. one credit card a week. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Mm. And mostly we don't know what that does. Yeah. 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 Question is, you know, the sense of, I guess, uh, when is a good day to start? Ask that question. Oh, uh, so he was asking, when's a good day to start changing things today, right? But we don't have to change everything all at once. That's too overwhelming. <laughs> like, that is phenomenally overwhelming. So it's really just figuring out what is something that's feasible, feasible for me to do today, and then sort of it'll snowball into, oh, I see the next thing I can do and the next thing. And we'll talk more about those specifics in a minute. I'm not gonna leave you with just a whole bunch of bad information, I promise. But how do you think our students feel when they hear this information in their classes or they're seeing it in the news? Overwhelming. Yeah, it's a lot, especially if you're 18, 20. <laughs> 
Um, so now imagine if we all talked about this more, if it wasn't something that we just heard about occasionally and got overwhelmed by it. And then we're like, I gotta go get a coffee and move on with my day. Cause I can't think about this anymore. Imagine if we all knew our place in the solution and we understood what we could do to contribute. And imagine if we all celebrated that progress together as community. So I'm going to take a minute to talk about something called STARS. Um, STARS is the Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Reporting System. I know Robin is on here and she is familiar with STARS. <laughs> um, so it is a report card for how the university is doing in sustainability. It is specific to universities. If you're familiar with things like ESG reporting from corporations, then it's going to be um, pretty similar to that. Um, but it's really tailored to universities. So it includes academics, it includes um, our operations on campus, what we're doing directly, how we're planning, not just for sustainability, but in general, how are we incorporating sustainability into that and our finance. Um, it's used by places like Princeton Review to measure sustainability progress. And it's used by hundreds of universities um, around the country to help us all evaluate how we're doing, compare, learn from each other. It's all publicly reported. so there's a category that I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do to you know, improve our score here. I can look and see what other schools who are doing really well in that category are doing. Um, I can see that there are chats, but I can't see them. So I don't know if people had questions. No, okay, they're good. Oh, okay. Overwhelming and depressed. Overwhelming and depressed, yeah. Yeah. Um, so these are the categories of stars. So even if you yourself did not answer questions um, when we were filling out the stars report, if you didn't get an email from Leah here, uh, <laughs> you're probably working on something indirectly or maybe directly that is connected to one of these buckets. So we look at curriculum, we look at research, campus engagement, broader community engagement, how we're managing our buildings and other resources on campus, dining, procurement and waste, social equity, transportation, well-being, and work. Um, there are 600 data points. Oh, a lot of data points that we're collecting, so more than one in each of these categories. These are just a few of the credit names to give you a better sense of exactly what we're looking for. So when we look at um, academics, we're looking at the number of departments across campus that are offering at least one sustainability class. We're looking at um, the centers that we have that are dedicated to sustainability research. We're looking at how we're engaging staff in sustainability and what training we're providing for staff around sustainability, like this. Um, we're looking at our community partnerships and how those are addressing social um, issues and also environmental issues. For buildings, operations, and maintenance, how are we managing the buildings that have been around for a while to make sure that those buildings are efficient, but also healthy? That's part of being a green building is being a healthy building. Uh, we look at our greenhouse gas emissions. That might be the most obvious. Um, we look at how we're recovering food and reducing food waste in our um, dining system. We're looking at sustainable procurement. So are we including sustainability in the RFPs that go out and asking about sustainability from the companies that we're choosing to do business with? We look at how people get to campus. Um, we look at how the institution is governed and who is governing the institution. Does that population reflect um, society as a whole. Uh, we look at racial, racial and ethnic diversity, gender. We look at student success. Are students graduating at the same rate regardless of who they are? Um, and we look at employee rights. What types of benefits do we have on campus that allow us to succeed and do our jobs? So um, Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson is a marine biologist. She's a climate researcher. She's an advocate for climate policy. She is fabulous in so many ways. I highly recommend checking out her, her um, work and her books. And um, she has talked a lot about how people ask her at the end of her talks, like, what can I do? So she came up with this Venn diagram to help you figure out your climate action. And she wants to start with what brings you joy? Like, if you're chugging away at something you think is important for the environment, but you hate every day of it, you're not going to be able to keep doing it. You're going to burn out and move on to something that does bring you joy. And think about what you're good at. What skills do you bring to the table that you can help move that needle forward with? And then looking at what work needs needed, needs being done. Um, so 
I'd like for everyone to just take a minute to think about this in terms of your work. You could also think about it in terms of home, but like, what are you doing on campus that could connect to some of those things that we just talked about? So I'm going to give everybody like 90 seconds to, to think. I was going to ask people to share with their neighbors, but we're a pretty small group. So if people want to just share any thoughts that they had, I would love to hear. Did somebody drop one in the chat? I just let them know that they could oh, okay, thank you. share and that they would read it. You know what? I might be a little biased, but I'm just trying to think outside of the box with this. And for me, something that brings me joy, everybody, and yeah, I work with Megan in the office sustainability, but something that brings me joy is working online and working with different visuals, making things look visually aesthetic and nice to look at. Um, and I think I'm good at doing that in a way to communicate information with people. And so that now kind of coincides with what I do in the office. Like I work now more a lot with different visual or visualization programs to communicate more smoothly. Yeah. Anyone else have something? I can tell you that the thing that brings me joy is talking to other people about this stuff. And so, um, like, I feel so energized when I get to talk to other people about sustainability and, um, and, you know, going back to that thought that 36% of people are even talking about this occasionally, I get to talk about it every day with people who care about it a lot and who are working to change things and make progress. And it gives me a lot of hope. And I wouldn't say I'm like crazy optimistic about everything, but I have a lot of hope in people. And I think that talking about it is a big part of that. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to share some tools that are really um, specific to who we are that can help you to do more of this within our offices. So we have something called the Green Office Program. Um, the program was designed to grow the culture of sustainability across the university. We want it to help build community within your office and across the, the university, across offices. Um, it's a checklist, so it's really designed to provide tangible sustainability guidelines that everybody can adopt in their offices. Um, we want to engage and we want to create opportunities um, to give everyone across campus some ownership of sustainability. So thinking back to that huge list of everything in stars, I don't own it all. I cannot affect like all of it directly, right? I really rely on other people across the campus to, to help with that. Um, this is just a shout out to our current green offices. If you're not in that list, I would really encourage you to join. Um, it's a You can review the checklist online, talk to your office about it. You'll invite somebody from our office to come and give a presentation. Um, you'll complete the checklist, you'll make some changes in the office, and then ultimately you receive recognition. In this program, um, in the checklist, there's things related to energy use and paper use and a whole host of other things, but there's also some fill in the blanks. And I think that those are the most important part of the program. Because there's a lot of things that we can all do, like kind of universally in office space, but then there are things that each one of our office does uniquely. And I think that's 
a really appealing part of university work is that we're like a mini city, right? So there's somebody doing all kinds of different things across the campus. And if we think specifically about our office and how we can uniquely impact it, then I think that that might touch in more to that. What skills do I bring? Where's my joy? And you can directly connect it to the real work that you're doing, not just, okay, I'm also gonna turn the lights off when I leave rooms, which is important for sure, but that's probably not what people are being like, I really impacted the environment today. <laughs> like I've done something really good and I feel good about knowing what my place is in that movement. Um, we're also adding something to green offices this year. We're going to have some community uh, gatherings that will happen a couple times a semester to bring people in the program together. Um, other people will be invited as well. They won't have to be a green office member to attend, but it'll be a chance to learn more about sustainability, engage with other people, and um, just can continue that community building across staff offices. We also have the green teaching uh, elements of this for our faculty side. Um, there are two separate things. First, there's the green teaching program, which is run by CTRL, and it's really focused on how you teach. Are you thinking about your paper use, your uh, energy use as you're designing your class and thinking through like your day-to-day -day, uh, classroom uh, mechanics? Then there's also sustainability in the curriculum. So we have a whole bunch of tools available to help you teach about sustainability, regardless of the subject matter that you're specializing in. So we have um, on our website, we have campus resources that are dedicated to that kind of thing. We have um, uh, lesson plans that are available. We offer tours, uh, both sustainability tours and the Arboretum offers tours. We have a whole host of data that's available for faculty to use in their classes. We have access to external resources from different organizations. And then we provide ongoing conversations for faculty who are teaching to help share problems and, um, and solutions that they found really helpful. So once we've learned more about sustainability and understand the problem, how we can impact it, what our unique uh, role in it is going to be, it's a really good idea to know what your your positive impact is. And you can use things like the green office or the green teaching programs to see what you're already doing while you're also identifying your future opportunities. But it's good to acknowledge, like when you go through that green office checklist, I think it would probably be incredibly unlikely that you would be like, I'm not doing any of this. I need to change everything. You're probably already doing things. And so it's good to acknowledge the like contributions you're already making to these bigger goals. Um, if you want to do this for your at home side, you can use a personal footprint calculator. They're available all over. It asks you a bunch of questions about like uh, how much travel you're doing and what kind of travel you're doing, your diet, um, like what types of foods you're eating, um, your energy consumption, how big your home is. It asks all kinds of these questions about lifestyle that'll then translate into, oh yeah, here's your personal footprint and how, um, how that works. So it's good to focus on what we're already doing and then make sure that we're not hiding those things. So we wanna talk about the stuff that we are doing because I think our students get here and they don't see us talking about it. They And they make the assumption, I've met AU students, I think they're making the assumption that then we're not doing it if we're not talking about it, if we're not telling them about it, which is fair. Like, I think that's what's happening as a society that we're not talking about it. And then we make a lot of assumptions about what the person next to us is or is not doing. And so um, it's really good to start thinking about, all right, so if I think about the things that I'm already doing in my office, are they on our website? Are we talking about them publicly? Do we maybe have signs up in our office that's telling people like, hey, this is a decision we've made, join us in it. Are we making these things obvious when we have events with either signs or talking points? So is that the, start of the event is somebody getting up to tell, like these are the things that we did to reduce the environmental impact of this event. Here's how you can contribute. Here's what's gonna be compostable at lunch, that kind of stuff. Are you publicly recognizing your staff who are contributing either in a team meeting by saying, Leah, thanks so much for doing this this week um, or in whatever other way makes sense in, in your office culture. Are you including it in your RFPs to expand that reach out and to show not just on campus, but off campus that we care about this and that if you wanna work with us, we're, we're looking for this information from you. Um, are you thinking about it in your events beyond just composting? 
How are people getting to your event? How are you talking about sustainability when you're there? And then finally, are you talking to students about it? Are you telling them? Are you asking them their thoughts? Here are some examples of different things. Uh, when I Googled sustainability on a website, Chevron popped up and I was like, if Chevron can put this on their website and feel good about it, I think we all can. <laughs> um, then there's a, a example of a sign talking about it, but even better in this room, we have an example of a sign talking about sustainability, the green roof that's outside this window. Um, I don't know if I can turn this for a second. Can they see it? I don't know. I don't have <laughs> Yeah, so there's a sign and then a green roof right outside of, of this room. Um, this green roof was actually um, uh, created there had been a green roof there, it needed to be replaced. We got a grant from um, the District of Columbia that also paid for these signs. There's another one in the hallway. Our campus apiary is out there. So our, our beekeeping society does some work out on this roof. Uh, it's a really great example of sustainability on campus and the signs give people more information than they would get just walking by and seeing some green out there, right? Um, this example of uh, staff champions related to sustainability, and then finally um, just signage for an event, saying, telling people thank you for contributing to this and being part of it with us. So why don't we talk about this stuff more? I would argue it's just a solid bummer to like kind of feel like you're the person who's going to like be the Debbie Downer about how something that used to be fun isn't. Um, I like to joke that I can probably ruin anything that you enjoy by telling you what its negative environmental impacts are. I have a four year old and she's never getting a balloon like I am very anti balloons and um, like that's just the path that she has to live in her life <laughs> that her mom isn't giving her a balloon. She has gotten a few hand me downs so she's not like <laughs> completely without. Um, but we also have this tendency to assume that nobody else cares about this elephant that's sitting in the room with us right that if we don't talk about it, they're not gonna think about it. We're thinking about other things. We also don't wanna be the person to start an argument. Like what if you don't care about this? And I tell you that I care about climate change and you're like, it's not real, it's fake. We don't need to worry about that. And like it's out of our control, whatever argument is like the argument of the week. Um, you don't know what that other person is thinking. And that can be really scary, right? Are there other reasons that you guys feel in your own life that you're not talking about it? I kind of cover it. <laughs> I think for me, like when I don't talk about it, it's probably because it's a bummer. Like, I don't always want to feel, make, be the person who makes other people feel bad. <laughs> um, and talking about it is really hard, right? Um, I will say that I think on our campus, <laughs> we have the benefit of AU has already said we care about climate change as an institution, right? So it doesn't have to be our personal standpoint. This is the university standpoint. We care about it. Here's how I'm going to help a university goal. So you can kind of remove some of those scary parts from it by practicing at work where we're all trying to accomplish this university goal before we take it home and maybe have a harder conversation at a Thanksgiving table, which is also really important. Um, Catherine Hayhoe is a, a climate scientist um, out of Texas Tech. She focuses on talking about climate. Um, her husband is actually an evangelical preacher, and so she has spent a lot of time talking to the evangelical community about climate change. and um, Has a really good TED talk about it and like it's it's pretty fascinating to hear her ideas about how you can talk about this with people who probably disagree with you. Um, but talk about you talk about why it matters to you so um, an example might be I really like hiking and it makes me nervous now to bring my four year old out when there are more disease carrying insects more of the year because of warmer temperatures they're not dying off as much in the winter. Um, we went hiking and camping um, over Father's Day weekend, and I had to pull a tick out of her chest for the first time. And it was the teeniest, tiniest tick, and it made me very nervous. Like, I hadn't been in long enough to be a Lyme disease concern. I still checked it every day for a month <laughs> for a circle, but um, ticks actually have to be in you for a little while before you get Lyme disease. But 
bigger issues, you don't notice it and then it falls off and you don't even realize you ever had one. Um, but that stuff makes me nervous and climate change is directly impacting how many ticks we have, what their range is and other insects that are gonna carry diseases that could potentially have really long-term impacts on someone, right? Um, so that's probably not the climate change thing that we hear most, right? That's not the thing that's most people are getting nervous about. Um, but I also used to live in New Orleans. And so I think about the community that I still feel really connected to there and how they're directly impacted by storms and sea level rise and all kinds of other environmental problems. Um, There's also some comments in the chat. Oh, yeah. Sharon came from Wendy Anderson. Um, I think it's a hard thing for people to talk about because it's a long-term fix. It asks people to change their behavior and people can easily feel judged. Yeah. I think that, um, so uh, to paraphrase, <laughs> um, it's a long-term problem. It's not something we can fix tomorrow, right? Like a lot of other things may be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna switch which soap I buy and that's easy and no big deal. But it can also make you feel judged. Like, oh, I, that's the soap I like. Like that's the one that gets my dishes the cleanest or whatever. Um, and it is easy to feel judged and we can't do it all. And we're all gonna feel really passionate about something different because we're all unique people and we all have specific passions in life, right? And I think it's really important to let those, like to as individuals, as we start to adopt more behaviors to not judge others and like, oh, that's not the one that you've adopted yet. Like, oh, you haven't gone vegan yet, why not? Like there are big impacts there. I am not a vegan and I'm not a vegetarian. And I definitely occasionally feel judged by other <laughs> environmentalists who um, have chosen that to be their path. I do eat a lot less meat than <laughs> maybe I would otherwise, but um, yeah, it's not a path that I've chosen to take. And um, and so I think it's good to own like, okay, I have, I have to make these balances, but it, it can be really challenging. Like, I think that that's important to own. Um, I think it's also important to find other people who care. So as you're starting to say, you know, maybe I do want to eat a little bit less meat, but I don't know any good vegetarian recipes. I haven't found a vegan like meal that I really like, but I do know somebody who's a vegan. I'm going to ask them for some recipe recommendations and like start that conversation, create that back and forth, because maybe they're going to be like, oh, I saw that you did this and I'm really curious about that. And so I think instead of it being judgmental, just ask questions, learn more about that other person's choices. And maybe you won't go, you know, in the same direction, but maybe you'll adopt a little bit of it or it'll give you an idea to try something new. Um, yeah, so that goes into the next thing, like talk about the things you're doing and learning and changing. Don't just talk about the things that you've done and you feel like really expert in. Like right now I am embarking on redoing my kitchen and <laughs> I like work on green buildings for a living and I'm still like, which cabinets do I want to buy to make sure that they're made out of the most environmentally friendly thing and are not crazy expensive and are going to be healthy for my daughter and me. And like, there's a learning process that goes into everything new that we do. And it's good to own it and talk about it and help share the things that you're learning as you go through it. It's also good to find common ground. I have a cousin who uh, I disagree with probably about 89 percent of things <laughs> but we both really love our daughters <laughs> and we both really love being outdoors and going camping and so we have this common area where we're both like oh we do want to protect outdoors because we spend quality time there with our families right and so i think it's important to find that area where okay you know maybe we're never going to talk about politics because that is just not a place we need to go like neither of us is changing the other person's mind but we can both do something to improve where we like to go camping, right? So I think accepting that there's probably a limit to what we can do and acknowledging that and owning it is, is good. Like let's work within our sphere of influence and not create like um, too big of a to-do list for ourselves, right? There are a lot of people on this earth and we don't all need to do everything. <laughs> So what is the impact of this? If we learn about it, if we think about what we're doing, if we talk about it, if we make sure that the things that we're doing are public and that as we're learning new things, we're making those public as well. We can start to bridge that disconnect between what we're saying as a university and what our students are seeing us do and where they're seeing it. 
We can help decrease the feelings of isolation, not just for our students, but for ourselves. We're all working on this together. We all have a lot of work that we've done and a lot of work that we want to do, right? We can move that needle on mitigation of climate change. We can start to see the impacts on our campus. Um, we measure all of those things. So if you start to change something, you'll see that in the next STARS report, right? It's really pretty remarkable when you're like, oh, we did do these things and now our per square foot emissions is way less than it was in 2005. We have made huge changes across campus and because we're not just measuring things like greenhouse gas emissions, you can see the changes in academics. You can see the changes in other things right in our own STARS report. So there's opportunity um, to measure the successes that we're having and then talk about them even more broadly. Ultimately, this will create a cultural shift. And that's one of the biggest things in behavior change. So if you get to American University and you see that everybody else is using their once an eagle, always an eagle water bottle that they get during orientation. <laughs> um, like that is going to tell you that this is what I am part of this American University community. This is how that community behaves because I am part of it. I will adopt that behavior like that's part of the psychology behind these behavior change things. You're not going to be the one in your social group who's like, oh, I don't care. <laughs> like, um, it's just not who we are as people. You can think about it in terms of other things. Like if everybody you know likes the same kind of music, you're probably going to learn to like like that same kind of music if that's what your friends are listening to. Even if you're at first like, I'm not real sure about this, then you might give it a try. Um, and through this all, we can create spaces for students to feel safe talking about their climate anxiety. So I think right now um, we see a lot of them talking about it maybe with us in our office where they um, know that it's something that we also think about it. But I think they also see my office as like the anomaly. Of course you care about it. Like this is what work you do, right? Um, but I might not be the person that they have a personal relationship with. That's only a handful of students, right, each year. But they might have personal relationships with other people online or in this room. and. It's great to open that door for them to feel comfortable saying, this is really scary. Like, we don't know what's going to happen as we go into the future. That scares me. And like, that's so freeing to give them a space to say that and to share those, those feelings with somebody on our campus. As we move into fall, um, we've created a few uh, community building opportunities. Um, we're going to have Thursday crafting for students, <laughs> just an opportunity to maybe do some reuse crafts um, on campus. It's going to start off Thursday afternoons in the quad, and then we're going to move into the maker space in the library. Um, it'll just be for an hour. Anna, can you drop the time in the chat or tell me if I'm wrong? I think it's 1.30 to 2.30 on Thursdays. Um, and then um, we also have an eco reps program. All students are welcome to apply. Basically, if you apply, you get in. So if you see students who are interested in this kind of stuff, encourage them to apply to be an eco rep. Those students volunteer two hours a week with our office to help us share sustainability information and to um, help kind of move the needle on that cultural shift that we want to see around sustainability. We also have the eco pledge. Um, so similar to green teaching or green office, the eco pledge is for students to pledge to adopt sustainable behaviors while they're a student at AU. Um, we uh, give each student who enrolls in that program a set of reusable utensils so that they can make their changes visible as well. Um, and then we're going to be rewriting our sustainability plan. And so um, it's coming up on its fifth anniversary, so it's time to make it new again. Um, the last time we redid it was after we had achieved carbon neutrality. And so that was really uncharted territory, figuring out where we were going to go next with that plan. Um, we incorporated environmental justice and wellness uh, in a more explicit way than we had in the past, like they had their own sections. And so now it's just time to give this plan a refresh. So what do we as a community want to focus on as we go forward? And we'll have lots of opportunities. Um, I don't have the timeline for it yet, but once we have it rolling, we'll have lots of opportunities for um, our students to give their input as well as staff and faculty to give input as well. Last time we did this, we did the same thing where we asked for input. We got more than 300 
um, suggestions, and the vast majority of those got incorporated into the plan. So it wasn't just something that we said, that's nice. <laughs> it really got rolled into our thinking, like this is what our community wants to see. So how can we bring this into um, our planning process? Um, so this is my email. Um, as we go forward, you guys are always welcome to reach out to me directly to my office. Um, we have been working hard to redo our website this summer too. Thanks, Leah <laughs> and Anna online. Um, so uh, information should be a lot easier to find on the website now. Um, but if you're having trouble finding anything or you are curious about something that's not on there, please don't hesitate to reach out. We really want to make sure that we're making it easier for you all to do sustainability work in your day to day jobs. So please keep that in mind. Um, does anyone have questions? Yeah. Can you go back to the. Yeah. Um, so my question is, what was I going to ask? So, I mean, I guess connected to what students can do, but even thinking back on some of your questions about some of the barriers to doing some of this work is that it can be a cost, even though the benefit is great. Um, and that, like, to do these programs, we have to put time and energy and resources into that. Um, so I guess what suggestions you have for faculty or other offices on campus, maybe don't have a sustainability budget, but things that they can do that are like free of cost, even if they take some time and energy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say that there's a lot. So I think it's the way we think about sustainability. A lot of times we think about, okay, um, I need to think about all of these things in silos. And instead of thinking about sustainability as another bucket you need to do, take a minute to say, okay, well, how does this other thing I'm already focused on connect to sustainability? Mm -hmm. Instead of creating a separate sustainability program, how can I weave sustainability into a lesson plan I'm already teaching? I'm actually giving a talk next week um, for faculty to help them integrate sustainability into curriculum. And Leah helped me use AI <laughs> to um, create a prompt for a faculty member, a pretend faculty member teaching a class. And so um, I took a class in college called Early Christian and Byzantine Art. It was just to fulfill a requirement, but it turned out I loved the class and I learned a ton of stuff that I never thought I would learn. But I was like, what's a class that I don't know how it connects to sustainability. And I said, early Christian and Byzantine art. How are we going to connect that to sustainability? So Leah made a prompt and asked ChatGPT to come up with 10 different ideas to connect that class, that topic with sustainability. It came up with like the materials used in the process. I don't remember what else do you remember, Leah? Connecting some of the images to nature. Yeah, images, imagery and nature. Um, yeah, so the, like a whole host of different things came up. And so, you know, you might want to try chat, chat GPT. I would say AI uses a ton of energy. So keep that in mind. It's kind of overwhelming how much electricity AI uses. But, um, but yeah, just think through like, okay, maybe something I'm doing connects to it in a way that I haven't considered yet. And then weave it in that way. Instead of thinking about it as a whole, like I need one more thing on my to-do list because none of us need one more thing on our to-do list. We all have enough. <laughs> so, and I think that's how you're gonna find, like going back to the idea of finding joy and like, what am I good at? That's where you're gonna find it in those things that you're already working on. Not necessarily in like, I need to become expert in all these things that Megan works on. Like that's, we should all have a way to connect our jobs to sustainability without having to have a job like I have. And I think that's important to think about when we think about our students too, that they're majoring in all different kinds of things. They have all different kinds of passions, but 71% of them want to learn more about sustainability and, they're, and maybe even more and they just aren't finding the classes. <laughs> Other questions? This one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's a comment in the chat that's really good to know AI takes a lot of energy. I don't know if others want to hear more about that, but yes. I think that's a, a new. I don't have 
the stat on the top of my head, but um, yeah, can you Google how much energy they use really quick? It's like in the, in the next couple of years, it will use like the same amount as an entire state. Yeah, it uses a mind blowing amount of energy. Yeah. 460 terawatt hours that can increase to 620 and or over a thousand terawatt hours in 2026. Can we get an equivalent? Yes. <laughs> I don't think I've ever even lot, but thought about energy in terawatts. <laughs> That's a, a unfathomable number, um, which gives you a sense of scale. But yeah, it's something that doesn't come up a lot. I think we talk about other concerns with AI a lot, like intellectual property and all these other things. Um, but energy is also something that we should keep in the back of our heads if we're thinking about how we're going to use AI and what its impacts are on um, on people like yeah yeah I think the intellectual property element of people but then if we're using that much electricity where are those data centers located who lives next door to that data like there's all these environmental justice components too right mm -hmm. um, that aren't making the headlines so apparently the entire world uses 20 terawatts of power at like any given time of the day so 460 terawatt terawatts is roughly like 23 times the total global energy consumption. I don't know if people online heard that, but the entire world uses 20 terawatt hours. Is that right? Yes. And then AI uses? Allegedly 460 terawatt hours. That's what Google. Oh, like coming. Yeah, like it, so it could use as much as in no, the future. No, like as of 2022, it said. That it was already consumed, but those numbers don't. That make doesn't make sense. sense. Yeah, we have to find better numbers, but um, it uses a lot. <laughs> now that we've asked this question, I'm going to get it into my slide yeah. for for next week. <laughs> um, other questions, thoughts, ideas? Maybe even in line with. In line with the question about how much energy AI uses, I think there's also this general perception that less paper is better and more yeah. email and more computer and more zoom meetings and is yeah. that really even true anymore or is it or there's sometimes they to be using like recycled paper versus um, i think that's a good life cycle question for maybe some of our students in environmental studies yeah, to answer really because i think it's a good question if we're putting everything online how much data center energy is that taking i think there's also like i just read the anxious generation i don't know if others have read that one yet um but like is it really better to have that much screen time um as we're developing young people and like that stuff all matters too these are complex and complicated issues and you know it's a work in progress as we all learn and move forward um i hope someone does a complex on this course about <laughs> AI and sustainability <laughs> I I would love to teach that with somebody who knows about the AI side, like <laughs> it can combine. Um, I am curious. So at the start of the presentation, I had a lot of heavy and deep information and not so uplifting. How are we feeling now as we like prepare to like leave? Do you feel like you have a better sense of what you could do to move forward or how you might think about it? Do you still feel really bummed? <laughs> um, I don't feel like nothing think about how I can help in my daily work. Yeah, thinking about how you can help in your daily work. Sorry, I'm just repeating it for people yeah. online. Yeah. I think mean, saying like how how do I like in the office in the computer? Yeah. Doing doing the work and. Um, you know, where it does still seem overwhelming, you know, and I feel like in the day to day life, there's so much plastics. You yeah. Know? It, it's so hard, like all the products you buy, food stuff you buy. And it's like, how do you avoid it? You know, buying a bag of bread. Yeah. And you go to the bakery instead, you know? Um, yeah. So it's like that made the choices we make. Yeah, so this comment was about it being overwhelming, the number of things that you could possibly focus on. And I think it's really important to just say, all right, if you're thinking about your grocery shopping and the amount of plastic, what's one thing that's 
maybe simpler to choose. Like, okay, I really like the farmer's market bread on Wednesdays. So I'm going to switch my bread mm -hmm. and ask them to not put it in the plastic bag because mm -hmm. you can do that at the farmer's market. <laughs> but um, like it's, it is too overwhelming to change it all at once. It's not feasible. It's not practical. It's going to be overwhelming. I definitely don't recommend it. <laughs> I have not a hundred percent eliminated my plastic use because you can't. I have a four-year-old. <laughs> Sometimes she wants a juice box <laughs> or a candy bar. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's it just try to like focus on joy and what am I good at instead of saying, what are all the things I need to do? And Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson also has a TED talk. Highly recommend hers as well. She's got a very calming voice. It's also just really delightful to listen to her talk. 